Okay, we're going to start chapter 27, but as you remember in the last chapter, um, Isabel was up getting water from the well and Grandfather uh, kissed her branded cheek and told her she needed to find her River Jordan and that was going to get her to freedom. Uh, whatever that River Jordan might be, he used it kind of as a, as a figurative type thing. And um, for some reason, Curzon isn't talking to her. Well, she said she would never talk to him again, so that could be part of it. Okay, so we're into August now, um, August 26th through September 14th, getting into the fall. The British thrashed the Patriots in a big battle in Brooklyn. Thrashed them, but good. They killed or captured near a thousand rebels and sent the rest scurrying away. After the worst of the battle, the skies opened up again and we all waited. And we all waited, us in a house with leaking windows and a damp parlor, the soldiers in open fields and muddy ditches. We waited for the rain to stop. Madam wore a groove in the floor, pacing back and forth, awaiting news of the final, final British victory, her footsteps tipping and tapping in measure with the ticking of the clock. I poked at the logs in the kitchen hearth, trying to summon back to the bees so they would summon back the bees so they would chase out the thoughts invading my brain span. But the words of the bald man echoed. Would the British truly free me? Should I flee to them? What about Ruth? Would they help me find her? The firewood was wet and green. It would not catch. It smoldered and smoked and made a terrible stink. When morning came, a thick fog smothered New York, the kind Mama called a pea super. When the fog finally lifted, the American army was not to be found. Washington's men had spent the dark night and foggy morning rowing all of the troops back to the New York island. Some 9,000 men, folks said. That Washington was a conjure man, for sure. Madam took to her bed when Becky brought back the news. I muttered a quiet blast and continued to eat my dinner, porridge with dried apple. Becky didn't hear me. She was going on and on about the nasty things she had passed by at the campgrounds. And there was this one lad, oh, he had his hands blown clean off and a grubby bandage wrapped around his wrist. And I looked at that and I said to myself, that army's coming off next, young man. Oh, that arm's coming off next, young man. And maybe your leg for good measure on account of a noxious pestilence that filled the air. The stench of the place and the groans and moans. So these are all the things Becky saw in the, in the camps. She shivered with gruesome delight. If I had a stronger stomach, I'd take a nurse job and help a bit with the washing of the wounds and the like. But with this heat and the flies, you just know the wounds will be maggoty by morning. And if there's one thing I can't abide, it's the sight of maggots and living flesh. That's Becky talking. I looked in my bowl. The dried apple bits curled like fresh hatched maggots. I stopped eating. Becky ladled out her own meal. They's all saying that this proves the Lord himself is on the side of the rebellion on account of that fog he created. Did the same for them back in Boston. Blew in a thick mist so the American army could win the day. Seemed to me that if God really wanted the Americans to win, he would have sent sea monsters to devour the fleet when it left Boston. As I went to empty my porridge into the scrap bucket, Becky pointed to her own bowl. I filled it with my leftovers and commanded my belly to stop flip-flopping so at the sight of the flip-flopping at the sight of the curly apples. Becky paused with her spoon in the air. Makes a body wonder, though. What? I asked. Washington has them melt had them melt down the church bells and remake them into cannons. That will surely displease the Lord, if I say. If God switches sides and allows the British to take New York, you'll see me headed for Jersey. Back pay or no back pay? I'm not sitting here waiting to get carved into pieces by them beastly redcoats. It took me eight days of slow trips to the markets and the water pump before I finally spied Curzon working with the other men to set up a filthy tent in the mud of the battery campgrounds. It was good to see him, not dead or not chopped up. So she's kind of glad to see him. Hmm. All right, this is the next chapter. Now we're into mid-September. The true invasion of New York started with the firing of a hundred ships' cannons when we were at church Sunday morning. The first blast made the women shriek. The second blast made me wonder if God himself was fixing me to blow the island apart. I'm sorry. 
The second blast made me wonder if God himself was fixing to blow the island apart. The third blast caused us to run for the door. Rebel soldiers were dashing every, in every direction on the street, muskets in their hands, officers bellowing loud. The horses pulling carts and carriages whinnied nervously, bobbing their heads up and down and rolling their eyes in fear of the commotion and noise. The cannons roared again. The sound was coming from the East River side of the island to the north. I searched the skies for flaming comets, but that was how I pictured a cannonball would look. All I saw were startled birds and campfire smoke. The city itself seemed unharmed, though, though fear ran neck deep. Madam reached out and grabbed at the coat of an officer striding toward the battery fort. He whirled a curse on his lips, but caught himself when he realized he was speaking to a lady. Does this unholy racket mean the arrival of the war? Madam asked. Yes, ma'am, the officer said, but you need not be afraid. The generals have the matter well in hand. He hesitated as the cannons roared again. Civilians should go home and lock your doors. Do not peer out the windows. Madam contemplated him coolly. What are those men doing? She asked, pointing to the campground. The soldiers were quickly assembling their guns, ammunitions, and whatever they could stuff into their sacks. They moved so fast you'd have thought the ground was on fire. We are preparing to meet the enemy, he said. You're running away, she asked. Oh, no, ma'am, he said as he started to move away from her. We're moving up to Fort Washington to guard the King's Bridge. He shouted to be heard as a wagon pulled by four horses, pulled by four horses raced by. We must follow orders. Indeed, Madam said. Becky had the Sabbath off. Sabbath is another day for Sunday. Becky had the Sabbath off, so I served Madam her meal of cold pork, peas, and onions cooked with sage. She was calm about finally, finally having war at her doorstep and thousands of riled up menfolk marching with guns. In fact, as she ate, she kept a sheet of paper, a quill, and an ink bottle by the side of her plate and would from time to time jot down a word or two. When her plate was empty, she spoke to me direct. I am preparing a list of items for you to purchase. You may leave as soon as the dishes are washed. Beg pardon, ma'am? I need you to go down to the shops. I've no doubt Elihu will soon return home, and I'd like to celebrate with a suitable meal. It's a shame the turtles are so hard to come by here. Elihu loves turtle soup. Had she lost her mind? But... The cannons, ma'am, I started. The battle. Surely it will be a few days before. Most of the items can be purchased at Mr. Mason's. She dipped the quill, quills like a feather uh, pen, and she scratched out another item. He's a thieving rat of a man, but he's loyal to the king. I know he's been, he's been boarding his best wares. And she paused as cannons fire, cannon fired, boomed against, again from the north. I don't know why the rebels don't just surrender. They cannot win. I froze at the sideboard. The words of the bald-headed man came to me. If the British win, we'll all be free. Could it be so simple, I thought? Might the invaders liberate me from this nightmare? Was this my chance? Madam said something, but I couldn't make out her words. Yes, ma'am. I mumbled, my hands doing the work of a slave, my mind racing free. I will run and join the British. The thought washed over me like a river, uh, sweeping away the dead bees that had filled my brain pan with confusion. The answers tumbled one after another. They'd grant me freedom and give me work. I'd save my money and make, make my way to Nevis and rescue Ruth. Plain, simple, and true. Are you deaf? Madam scolded me. I had been staring at the door and not minding her words. She shook the paper in her hand. I said, take this to Mason. If he can't supply you with everything, he'll direct you where to go. I'll be going home, I thought. And you can fetch your own food and empty your own chamber pot and carry your own blasted firewood from this day forward, I thought, but did not say. Girl, Madam squinted at me and tilted her head to one side. Are you feverish? I gave thanks that she could not hear my thoughts. No, ma'am. I put the list in my pocket and set the last knife on the tray. I'm strong as can be. I'll go to Mr. Mason's directly. I, p 
paused at the parlor door. I may be delayed a bit, ma'am, I said with care. What with the commotion and all? A dozen, or so, a dozen or so soldiers dashed from the middle of the street, their boots thuttering, thudding. It cannot be helped, madam said with a sigh. So it's good that she told her she may be delayed. Hmm, I wonder what she's up to. Walking down Broadway, I was a fish swimming in the wrong direction. Everyone else in New York flowed north and fought against my progress. Continental troops in ragged formation, militia units carrying packs and haversacks, small artillery pieces pulled by horses and carts weighed down with women and children. The noise was deafening. Along with the shouts of men and women, every dog in the city was barking alarm. Pigs squealed underfoot, and occasionally a musket would fire, which led to shouted, shouted oaths and yelps. Drum beats and fifes blew, and beneath everything was the steady clockwork blast of the British cannons firing at the troops stationed north of us. I kept to the front of buildings, ducking into doorways when necessary, until I finally took refuge in the abandoned Chandler shop. The door was locked, but the front windows had been smashed to bits when the owner was tarred and feathered some weeks previous. I crawled through the window, taking care not to cut myself on the glass shards jutting out of the window frame. I set my basket on the floor. Ruth's doll rested inside it under a rag. That was the one thing I could not leave behind. The shop smelled musty and damp, and shelves stood empty. All the candles and other goods were stolen the day they ran the Chandler out of town. It was a gloomy place, but would serve well as a temporary shelter. I stood by the window and watched the tide of people roll out of the city. Hurry, I silently urged them. Hurry, I also urged the British Army. I did not want them to land right away, not until the last of the crowd had fled. But it would be nice if they arrived right quick after that, before Madame could hire someone to seek me out. Finally, the crowd thinned and cartwheels could be heard. Cartwheels could be heard echoing up the road. I waited a little longer, just to be sure. A few Continentals dashed by, their hands holding their hats on their heads, and canteens and cartridge cases, cases banging against their backsides. They were followed by a rough-looking militia unit that was trailed by a group of slaves carrying shovels and pickaxes. I searched for a familiar red hat, but did not find one. When the air fell still, with just a few voices calling orders in the distance, I hiked up my skirts and crawled out through the window. So, sounds to me like she's running. And running to where? We'll find out. Hopefully Madame Lockton doesn't find out too soon to get her, um, to get someone to, to run after uh, Isabel. Hopefully she'll be able to get somewhere where she'll be safe. Okay, stay tuned.